Welcome to Animal Logic's Holiday Special. We're doing a deep dive into all the animals and plants that make this season special. From whimsical northern ungulates, to poisonous parasites we like to kiss under, to adorably deadly three meter tall bears. These are our favorite wintertime species. Hi, I'm Danielle Dufault and you're watching Animal Logic. Santa's reindeer, or caribou as we like to call them here in Canada, were either all females or very young males that were replaced every year. Unlike other deer species, both sexes of reindeer grow antlers. Older males' antlers fall off in early December, well before Santa comes around with his flying herd. The females, on the other hand, keep their antlers until early spring. Young males also keep their antlers later into the year, meaning that Santa either replaces his herd of reindeer every year, a chilling thought, or they're all ladies. Take that, patriarchy! There are many different types of reindeer, or Rangifer tyrandus, and they can be found throughout the Arctic, tundra, boreal forests, and really anywhere cold in Europe and North America. In A Visit from St. Nicholas by Clement C. Moore, the first poem to feature reindeer alongside Santa, the reindeer were described as tiny. If you've ever seen a reindeer, you probably wouldn't use that word. Reindeer weigh up to 180 kilograms or 400 pounds and stand up to 1.7 meters or 5.6 feet tall at the shoulder. Add their massive antlers to that, which can grow up to a meter or 3.2 feet wide and 1.3 meters or 4.2 feet long, and you have anything but tiny. The reindeer in the poem that pull Santa's sleigh were likely the Norwegian subspecies, the Svalbard reindeer, which were much smaller. They weigh around 75 kilos or 165 pounds and measure around 80 centimeters or two and a half feet tall. It's just so cute. Reindeer start growing those impressive antlers in the spring. The males use them for fighting one another to impress females. And since their mating season is in the fall, there's no need to keep the antlers around much after that. The females, however, keep their antlers, likely to give them a competitive advantage when scrounging for food for her and her baby in the winter months. When the males lose their antlers, the antlered females take the position as top of the food hierarchy. But this doesn't explain why females need antlers in the first place. One theory suggests that female reindeers grow antlers so they'll look like young males. Adult males will confront younger males as soon as they become a threat, potentially even pushing him out of the herd. This strategy is used by the mothers to confuse the adult males as to who the young males really are, buying some time for them to grow bigger before setting out on their own, thus giving them a better chance at survival and continuing the gene pool. A newer theory suggests that female reindeer have antlers because a large part of their habitat is open terrain, and they need those antlers for defense, much more so than, say, white-tailed deer, which live in more densely wooded areas. Reindeer are purpose-built, cold-weather survivors. Their coats are made up of two layers, a woolly inner layer and a long-haired outer layer made up of styrofoam-like hollow hairs. These trap warm air in and keep them insulated from the elements. Not only does this hollow hair provide warmth, but also buoyancy. Much of their territory is made up of rivers, and rivers need crossing. Lucky for reindeer, their hollow fur acts almost like a life jacket, and they ride much higher in the water than other mammals. Not only that, but they employ the same countercurrent heat exchange system that ducks do. Basically, the blood that is pumped into their legs is cooled by the blood returning from their legs. This keeps their legs at a temperature warm enough to not freeze, but cold enough that there isn't a massive heat loss. Also, their noses help keep them warm, by warming up the air when they breathe in before it enters the lung. They also have adaptive hooves. In the summer months, when everything is wet, their hooves are spongy, which gives them extra traction. But in the winter, when everything sucks and is frozen, the spongy parts harden and form a horn-like rim. Each hoof has four toes that they can spread out across the snow, like snowshoes, distributing their weight. 
The underside of each hoof is hollowed out, and they can use this crevice as a shovel for digging for food through snow. Possibly the most interesting thing about reindeer is their migration. In one year, they will travel more distance than any other mammal in the world. They will travel over 5,000 kilometers or 3,100 miles in a year, often covering more than 37 kilometers or 23 miles per day. Reindeer are quiet animals, and outside of mating, they don't make much noise. When they do vocalize, they use large air sacs in their necks that allow them to emit a hoarse rattling sound, which males use to deter other males, but females use it to tailor individual calls to their offspring, which they need because reindeer herds can be massive. In 2001, the George River caribou herd in Quebec, Canada reached 385,000. Unfortunately, that number has since shrunk by 81% to 74,000. This trend is sadly happening around the world, and the last three decades have seen reindeer number drop by 60% due to climate change and habitat loss. If we could all just be a little more conscious of our actions and their impact, I'm sure we could all make a big and meaningful change. Mistletoe refers to over 1,000 species in the Santa Lely's order. Now you might be thinking there must be a connection between mistletoe and Santa Lely's. It's nothing but a Christmas coincidence, which is coincidentally, also the name of a 2018 Christmas film starring Kathy Lee Gifford. Mistletoes are spread over three families, commonly known as showy mistletoes, feathery mistletoes, and the sandalwoods. But when we think of the mistletoe, we're usually talking about two particular species of the sandalwood or Santalaceae family. Viscum album, AKA the common mistletoe native to Eurasia, and Phoridendron leucarpum, or American mistletoe, which is endemic to North America. These two types of mistletoe are famous for their iconic ball shape, which can grow as wide as a meter across. Mistletoe flowers from March to May with small pale yellow or green blooms, which turn into sticky white berries from September to November. This plant loves frigid winters, staying fresh and green all season long despite the cold. In fact, this is when it's most noticeable, when the leaves of its host tree have fallen down around it, revealing that iconic smooch-inducing greenery. A clue to how mistletoe manages to stay alive while others wither away is in the name. Phoridendron means thief of a tree in Greek. While those evergreen mistletoe leaves are more than capable of creating their own energy through photosynthesis, mistletoe steals nutrients and water from its host tree. So I may have exaggerated a little when I implied that these plants are cold hard energy vampires. Mistletoe aren't actually fully parasitic. They're what's called hemiparasites, meaning that they don't have to get all of their nutrients from theft alone if they don't want to. And there are times when it's in a mistletoe's best interest not to take too much from its unwilling host. A recent study showed that when a tree is infected with more than one mistletoe, each will amp up their photosynthesis to produce more of their own food. This ensures that the host doesn't die and that the mistletoes too can keep on keeping on. When they do steal, they do it with haustoria, root-like structures that are able to penetrate the tree's bark and start sucking the juices. If you want to learn more about Hostoria, make sure to check out our video on Daughter, aka Strangleweed. Along with holly and poinsettias, mistletoe completes the trifecta of Christmas plants that are toxic to humans. While mistletoe may be poisonous to us, birds cannot get enough of their waxy white berries and are the most common spreaders of mistletoe seeds. The seeds are coated in a super sticky film called vicin. They either get stuck to the bird's beak which then uses the nearest tree branch or twig as a napkin, or they take a short trip right on through the bird's digestive system. The sticky seeds in the bird's poop cling to anything they come into contact with. If they stick to a tree, the mistletoe seed has found the perfect place to set up its new nursery. The word mistletoe comes from Anglo-Saxon and translates to dung twig. So this winter, when you're kissing your lover under the mistletoe, think of the romantic journey it took from a bird's cloaca. Despite its reputation for being a parasite, mistletoe knows how to give back. Lots of birds and insects rely on mistletoe for food and shelter. Close to 100 vertebrate families consume its nutritious fruit and nectar, and 50 call these evergreen spheres home. The forest floor, too, wins when mistletoe drops its leaves. Most leaf-losing trees make sure to suck every last nutrient out before letting them fly. But since mistletoe is a parasite and can steal whatever, whenever it wants, it doesn't have to worry about letting go of a few extra nutrients. When these chock full of goodness leaves break down, they give up their nutrients to the forest floor. So if you see lots of mistletoe in a particular area, it means there's a healthy bird population and it's a sign of a diverse ecosystem. If all parasites were this lovable, I'm sure we'd see lots more pet tapeworms.
In ancient times, mistletoe was used all over the world to treat a myriad of ailments, from convulsions to hysteria to delirium, with Pliny the Elder himself raving about its cancer-curing powers. Because of its toxicity, however, it lost some of that status as a miracle healer, though it is currently being investigated for its effect on lowering blood pressure. Adding to its medicinal mystique, the pharmacologically active substances found in mistletoe actually change depending on the host plant. Mistletoe that grows on nightshade plants, for example, has been found to contain nicotine, while those that grow on coffee plants are hopped up on caffeine. With so many species of mistletoe, there's a lot of twig to cover. But let's get down to a couple of the more unique and fascinating ones. First, there's lodgepole pine dwarf mistletoe, Arsithobium americanum, one of dozens of species in its leafless genus. It's unique in that it disperses its seeds by explosion. While some plants that we've covered on the channel explode from touch, like Himalayan balsam, or from environmental conditions like the sandbox tree, this species of mistletoe explodes from heat it generates within itself. It's called thermogenesis discharge, and it's the only plant in the world known to trigger explosive seed dispersal by warming itself up from the inside. Similarly, the limber pine dwarf mistletoe also spreads its seeds via explosion, using hydrostatic pressure to launch its seeds at speeds of almost 96 kilometers an hour. Tristerix in the Laurentiaceae family infects just two types of cacti in South America. Instead of growing in festive balls like some, this mistletoe parasite bursts out of the host from inside. Its near inability to photosynthesize sets it apart from its hemiparasitic mistletoe cousins, as Tristerix relies more heavily than others on its host for resources. So after learning about all the poison and the parasitism, why on earth do we kiss under these things during the holidays? There's a couple contributing stories, starting with Old Norse mythology. And no, I promise this is not the plot of the next Thor movie. Or is it? Taika? Loki, the god of mischief, had Baldur, the god of light and joy, killed with a twig of mistletoe after learning it was the only thing that could harm him. Celtic druids way back in the first century CE saw mistletoe as a symbol of virility, since its berries appear in winter when other plants have long withered up. Ancient Greeks and Celts even considered the sticky white berries to be a symbol of, ahem, male fertility. Ironically, one study showed that common mistletoe extract actually decreased the quality of sperm in rats. Wah wah. Through the centuries, the tradition of kissing under the mistletoe came about, though it's not entirely clear exactly when and how. A song published in England in 1784 is generally agreed to be the first reference to kissing under the mistletoe. Originally, it seemed, it was just a ruse for men to secure kisses from unwilling women. However, in a time and place where women had very little agency, some accounts suggest that mistletoe was a totally legit way for a woman to orchestrate a much desired kiss herself. While mistletoe may still steal nutrients from its hosts, thankfully, stealing kisses from an unconsenting person under one is no longer acceptable. I hope the romance of this toxic parasite helps you score your own consensual kisses this season. Today, we're in Churchill, Manitoba, paying a visit to the king of the north, the largest bear in the world, the polar bear. This is one of the largest towns on the Hudson Bay, and every year, thousands of people come to see one of the greatest hunters on Earth. Churchill was originally a port built by the Hudson Bay Company to ship pelts to England and as a fort to protect Canada from an invasion from the Arctic. As demand for fur dwindled and national security concerns shifted elsewhere, the town of Churchill became an afterthought. In the late 40s, it was such a forgotten area that Britain had plans to conduct nuclear tests in the region. This would have likely killed the entire bear population. But the weather was too harsh for the British nuclear scientists, and they chose to detonate their bombs in the outback of Australia instead. The town only became notorious because of stories of bear attacks, and the issues the locals were facing with aggressive bears became international news. The problem bears were initially relocated via plane and helicopter. 
These dramatic scenes attracted the interest of environmentalists and celebrities who traveled to town to see the bears. These were some of the first polar bear watching tourists. This is one of the southernmost polar bear populations and one of the most accessible. The geography of the town, as well as the several freshwater rivers that flow into the bay, make the water here freeze earlier than in some more northerly locations. Bears start arriving in the summer and stay on land until the fall. Late October is the best time to see them, as it's when the ice starts to form and bears venture out onto the ice to look for seals. Though if you come here in July, you can see fat bears returning from the ocean and frolicking among wildflowers. One of the few places in the world where this happens. Regardless of the season, driving outside of town requires extreme caution. This really isn't a place that I'd recommend going for a nighttime jog. Unless, of course, you're faster than a polar bear, which, spoiler alert, you're not. Polar bears are incredibly fast and powerful on land, but they're technically marine mammals. They're found throughout the Arctic's ring of life. Their scientific name, Ursus maritimus, means the bear from the sea. This is because for most of the year, they're out on the Arctic ice looking for its favorite prey, seals. In a couple months from now, these seals will only be able to breathe by popping up through breathing holes in the ice. And this guy here, he's gonna make a pretty delicious meal for a polar bear in a couple months. The entire biology of their digestive system is geared towards the consumption of marine mammal fat. Seals are a relatively easy prey because they come out of the water to breathe through breathing holes. Polar bears' huge schnozzes can sniff a breathing hole from over a kilometer away and will patiently wait for a seal to surface. Once they do, they grab it with their gigantic arms and pull it out of the water. Then, a bite to the head is the coup de gras. When the ice melts, this population of polar bears has to come to land and wait until the ice freezes again. During that time, they don't eat much. By this time of year, the bears have been fasting for over four months, so they're starving. And I'm out here looking like a tasty snack. Summertime is the lean months for bears, and they have to make do with less nutritious food. Studies have found not only birds, eggs, and small mammals, but also vegetation like grasses and berries in their feces. Sometimes, if they're lucky, a whale will wash ashore and provide a very welcome meal. And on very rare occasions, larger bears have been seen catching the belugas that come to give birth in the Churchill River. But these are only occasional treats, and bears will usually go hungry for about 15 weeks. Today is going to be an opportunity of a lifetime, and I can't tell you how excited I am. We're gonna be going out with Lazy Bear Expeditions on this giant tundra crawler to go and meet some bears on their turf. I can't wait. These trucks are absolutely massive. The windows are about three meters high to prevent even the largest bears from trying something sneaky. Oh yeah, they're climbing right up onto the vehicle, trying to see us in the windows. And the observation deck gives us the best view of this majestic tundra landscape. It's almost worse traffic than Toronto. Arctic traffic. Currently on the observation deck of this Arctic crawler, and I'm as safe as can be up here. Even the tallest polar bear can't reach me. It can see me from below, though. Right now, we're entering the wildlife management area, the best place to safely see polar bears in the region. But out on the tundra, wildlife can be difficult to spot. Welcome to everyone's favorite game, Is It a Rock 
Or is it an animal? Rock and roll, baby. That's an Arctic fox. Oh, negative 50 points. That's a rock. Nope, that's just me reaching rock bottom. What, you thought that was a rock? No, no, polar bear. Loser. Nope, that's Dwayne Johnson, AKA The Rock. All right, let's see the points on the board. Loser. This has been Animal Logic's Is It a Rock or Is It an Animal? Tune in next week. After a few hours out on the tundra, we finally spotted our first couple of bears. But they were far away and in an inaccessible spot for us. They're right there. Oh my gosh. They've just been resting right in the trees. So we kept searching. And then magic happened. Oh, wow. And there it is. It's our first big, beautiful bear. This polar bear's just taking himself for a little stroll down the side of the Hudson Bay. Now he's probably scanning the shoreline looking for washed up seals or belugas. Any kind of marine mammal would be an easy snack for him if it washed up. And then it got even better. A mama and her yearling cub who came straight up to us to check us out. Oh my God, wait, how many are there? There are two, two polar bears. This is one of the most magical moments animal lovers can experience. Seeing an apex predator gently approach you and look at you from just a few centimeters away can be life-changing. It's the reason every year over 10,000 ecotourists come here to get a glimpse at the king. No joke, I'm getting so emotional. Mama's coming to see us. Oh, I'm face to face with the polar bear. And she's curious to see us. Don't get too close. <laughs> it's not cute. It has claws longer oh, than I'm, your fingers. I'm not putting my hand on the thing, don't worry. <laughs> I don't plan on touching it. <laughs> can't stop crying. <laughs> this mama bear is just one of the most beautiful creatures I've ever seen. This might be the most meaningful encounter I've had through all my experience here with Animal Logic. I am just so beyond emotional about this and they're truly fearless. But I feel honored that this bear is giving us some time of its day and showing us its extreme curiosity. Up close, after their beautiful long faces and their bright, curious eyes, the next thing you notice is their gigantic paws. 
Most of the animals up here have large feet to prevent from sinking into the snow, but polar bears take that to the next level and have evolved these enormous furry paddles. Out in the open water, bears have to swim between ice islands in search of better feeding opportunities. And when the ice melts, they often have to swim back to the mainland. Polar bears can swim vast distances, and some have been recorded to swim up to 800 kilometers over a few days. These trips can be absolute odysseys, and the average adult bear can swim up to 40 kilometers in a single go. This, of course, takes a massive toll on them, and most yearlings don't survive them. To protect themselves from the cold, they have the advantage of being absolutely massive and having a thick coat of fur. Their round shape helps them lose less heat via the skin by decreasing their surface to volume ratio. Like other northern animals, these guys have smaller ears and shorter legs, all to help retain heat. All the animals out here are basically striving for the same thing. Become an orb, obviously. And the reason for that is because an orb has the lowest surface area to volume ratio. And that means it's the best for heat retention. Their coat has two layers of dense fur, and below that, there's at least 10 centimeters of fat tissue. Blood vessels attached to their fat deposits can be opened or constrained to help in thermoregulation. They're also giving us a wonderful view of the fuzzy underside of their feet, which is what helps retain heat and pad them from the frigid cold on the ice. All of this is necessary for survival, but while cubs build the bulk to be independent, they'll have to rely on mom. This pair you see behind me is a mother and her cub. The cub is probably getting very close to two years, at which point it's time to go forge its own path. But for now, there's still time to take a cozy afternoon nap with mom. <sighs> My heart. <laughs> So this mama polar bear is probably somewhere between 400 and 500 pounds, but at peak weight, she'd probably be more like 700 or 800. The reason why she probably lost so much weight is right behind me. Having a cub is a massive investment for the mother, and that usually means losing up to half of their body weight just in pure energy expenditure. The Churchill population is notorious because cubs become independent when they're one and a half years old, as opposed to two and a half in other populations. The availability of food and denning sites makes their youth a bit easier than that of bears in other areas. The area around Churchill is rich in peat, and dens built in this kind of soil are especially warm, feeling around minus five, even when it's minus 30 outside. For an animal this well equipped for the cold, it must feel like a warm, comfy sauna. When the cubs grow older, they come back to their baby dens. But these pampered bears are becoming the exception, and soon their world might change forever. Though global populations are relatively stable, some populations are declining, mostly due to the shortened winter season in the Arctic. You've probably seen pictures of starving bears on melting sea ice, and though that's obviously worrying, there's another issue that we'll be forced to tackle within the next couple of decades, human-bear conflict. Luckily, the experiences of Churchill give us a roadmap to deal with these situations. While many aggressive bears were successfully relocated, unfortunately, some kept coming back and had to eventually be put down when they got into town. Luckily, there were still military buildings from the old fort days, and an idea came up to lock up the problem bears. It was a three-strike type of situation. On their first strike, they'd be locked up for a couple of weeks. On their second strike, they'd be locked up until November. On their third strike, they'd be caught and placed in a zoo or put down if nobody could take them. But bears were still coming into town. 
and it was discovered that it was the dumpster that attracted the bears the most. More importantly, cubs that were coming to the dumpsters with their moms were more likely to return to town when they were older. That's right, the babies were getting bad habits from their mom. The dumpster was also dangerous for them as they would basically eat anything with a scent. Antifreeze, battery acid, car oil, anything. The likelihood of intoxication is very high, so the town of Churchill shut it down. The town now ships all of their garbage to a dump far away from bears. The money from tourism helps fund these measures to protect bears. But there might be issues that money can't fix. Though the global population of bears is hard to estimate and seems to be at the moment relatively stable in some parts of their range, there are areas where they're declining. Polar bears don't travel nomadically around the Arctic, but rather they stay within certain limits called subpopulations. The most studied subpopulations are those of the Hudson Bay and the Beaufort Sea, and there's strong evidence that they're declining. Longer summers mean longer fasting periods, which lead to lower reproductive rates. In some cases, males will even eat cubs. In the Hudson Bay, they're also facing extra threats from orcas and grizzlies, which are finding it easier to survive here. Grizzlies are smaller, but can usually beat up a polar bear in combat. Orcas used to stay away from the bay because sea ice would restrict access. But now, with less ice, they're able to get in and take seals and belugas. This competition for resources will affect the polar bears negatively. Despite being surrounded from all angles by these big tundra vehicles, this polar bear is just going for a stroll, not a care in the world. Whole reason? Because it is an apex predator. There's nothing out here that's going to be hunting it. So what is there to be afraid of? More bears are getting into human settlements, which often leads to them being killed. In some areas, there's a belief that polar bears are increasing because they're seen more around town. But this more likely means that they're there because they can't find proper food elsewhere. Following Churchill's example of identifying and removing problem bears, removing access to garbage dumps, and having a system in place for chasing away the curious bears will save both bear and human lives. Churchill's strategy might not suit every community in the Arctic, but it does give a well-documented case study on how to deal with human-bear conflict. Hopefully, more northern communities within the polar bear's natural range will follow this example, and this majestic species will continue to thrive and sploot for years to come. Oh my gosh, it's just a bear sploot. <laughs> I see my cat do this at home, but seeing the largest carnivorin in the world do the same pose is just mind blowing. <laughs> so where we are right now, it's in the middle of very nice open fields, lots of green space. And because of that, I actually hear a lot of other birds around too. There's an oriole singing in the trees. There's some swallows by the nest boxes out there. Maybe a couple of raptors flying around too. We are now on our way to meet the snowy owl, which I haven't seen in months. <laughs> Bubo scandiacus, aka the snowy owl, is the heaviest owl in North America, though we birders lovingly refer to them as just snowies. Snowies are big birds, and they can weigh up to two kilograms, which is a lot for a bird. They stand half a meter tall and have a wingspan of up to 1.5 meters, making them one of the largest owl species in the world. The snowy owl is a circumpolar species, which means it mainly lives way up north in the Arctic tundra of North America, Europe, and Asia. They like to live in flat open terrain, like the tundra, prairies, or anywhere else with large swaths of open hunting ground. 
Snowy owls have the same travel patterns as snowbirds, the name for retirees who fly south for the winter and return back north in the summer. But not all of them migrate, and some choose to tough it out in the Arctic all year round. And they dominate the high Arctic skies as the largest avian predator, which basically makes them the Ice King's blue zombie dragon from Game of Thrones. Except they're alive. And owls. The snowy owl's white feathers give it the perfect camouflage in winter, an advantage they lose in the summer when the snow melts. Adult females and juveniles are slightly darker in color and sport more dark brown flecks compared to the purer white adult males. To stay warm, snowy owls are swaddled in feathers from beak to talon. A downy layer of insulation is covered in thick feathers, which blankets their toes and even beaks to keep them toasty in frigid winter temperatures. Even when the air around them is negative 50 degrees Celsius, their pretty white parkas help them stay a balmy internal 38 degrees. To complete the ensemble, they have luminous eyes. These massive eyes give them excellent vision, but also make their faces quite expressive. Snowy owls have got two looks, pissed and shocked. Like most owls, the structure of their feathers is responsible for the snowy owl's ability to fly almost silently. While other birds make a loud flap when they fly, caused by the air turbulence their wings create, the specialized feathers of the snowy owl allow it to silently approach its prey from above. First, the serrated leading edges of the feathers break up the airflow. Then, as the air travels along the wing to the trailing edge, fringed feathers further reduce the air disturbance. Finally, the soft downy feathers of the underside of the wings and legs absorb any additional noise. It's a perfect combination that enables the snowy owls to permanently operate in stealth mode. Snowy owls aren't particular about what they eat and will hunt mammals, birds, and sometimes even fish if they're spending time near the coast. But the snowy owl's favorite snack? A nice, juicy lemming. They can eat up to 1,600 lemmings a year. When life gives you lemmings, make lemmingade. They eat so many lemmings that sometimes they will morbidly line their nests with lemming fur to keep their chicks warm. Snowy owls are opportunistic hunters. Most of the time they catch their prey by sitting on a perch and waiting. They're equipped with excellent vision and even better hearing. So if their target is moving under the snow, they can still hear it. When snowy owls hunt from the air, they generally cruise low to the ground. They're fast flyers and can reach speeds of 80 kilometers an hour. And with their specialized feathers, they cover this ground silently. Once they spot lunch, the snowy owl quickly and quietly goes right in for the kill, snatching their prey with their sharp talons. Like many other birds of prey, the snowy owl likes to eat small prey whole. Their strong stomach juices digest the prey's flesh, while the indigestible parts like teeth, bones, fur, and feathers get packed together into little pellets that the owl regurgitates 18 to 24 hours after feeding. So cute. The snowy owl needs to eat about 10 rodents a day to meet its nutritional needs. Luckily, their hunting success rate is about 45%. Those are pretty good odds. The availability of lemmings can often directly impact the snowy owl's ability to nest, with them sometimes foregoing breeding entirely if their prey is scarce. If they do breed, the male will bring the female a lemming snack. It's the snowy equivalent of chocolate-covered strawberries. After breeding, the female will make a depression, called a scrape, directly in the tundra to lay her eggs. The more abundant the lemmings that year, the more eggs she will lay. The male will then continue to feed her as she remains atop the eggs for about a month. Once they hatch, Papa Owl continues to bring food to both Mama Owl and their owlets. At around seven weeks old, the hatchlings are ready to fly, but mom and dad continue to feed them until they're around 10 weeks old. When they're not breeding in the spring, they like to chill out all on their own. Like most loners, snowy owls are the shy, silent, mysterious types. Unless somebody trespasses onto their territory or nest. And that's when the snowy owls go into attack mode, hissing, screeching, clapping their beaks, 
dive bombing, even striking their intruders. Okay, we get it. You like your space. Unlike most owls, snowy owls aren't nocturnal. They prefer being active during the day, especially in the summer. They really do have no choice, though, in the Arctic when the days are 24 hours long. While they usually spend most of their lives in the Arctic, certain conditions, like a strong breeding season, can pull them out of their usual tundra territory and push them further south, causing a snowy owl invasion, known as an eruption. That's eruption with an I, not an E. During the 2013-2014 snowy owl eruption, individuals were spotted as far south as Florida. Imagine being able to see a flamingo and a snowy owl in the wild on the same day. Talk about a birder's dream. But seeing snowy owls in the wild is becoming harder and harder. For more on that, we have a very special correspondent reporting to us live from Alaska. Take it away, Danielle. All right, this is day two at the Kroshal Wildlife Park. And we're here with Steve Kroshal, and he's going to give me an introduction to Ookpik, the snowy owl. Yesterday, we tried to make an acquaintance, but he was a little bit shy. So now that he knows my scent and what I look like from yesterday, maybe day two, he'll be a little bit more open to spending some time with us. Do you think that owl, snowy owls can smell? Hmm. I'm not I sure. Wonder. I wonder. That's a big question. I keep asking everybody. I know they can hear really well and see really well, but I'm not sure how much scent would, would matter to them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna gonna talk now because he's right in the cabin. All right. And, that, and, and remember that. Oh, 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 oh. A oh. little lower, a little lower. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Okay, that's as low as I can go. Okay, so I'm gonna open the door. Oh, that's Ookpik. Oh, oh, oh. Ookpik is looking a little more comfortable this time. Ooh. I'm gonna stay back here until he ah. retrieves him because entering an enclosed space with an owl who's not familiar with me might make it uncomfortable. So only a few birds in the world that have feathers instead of scales. Yeah. But an interesting thing about the scales on a bird's feet is that they're actually adapted feathers. So this is the original form that birds evolved before developing scaly feet. So this is actually an ancestral condition. This is going great so far. Oh. Yeah, that's good. Oh. That's good. Oh. Probably basic. Come with me, Danielle. You're going to walk right alongside. And we're gonna walk over here to the snow and we're gonna try to get him on a, uh, uh, a little mound there so he can talk more about snowy owls. All right. Have you ever touched a snowy owl before? I haven't. Are you sure he's okay with this? I think so. We're gonna find out just right All there. Right. Oh, 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 they just talk like this. Oh, oh you're oh, so oh, soft. Oh, go, go, go. Yeah, that's it. Aren't you just a beautiful bird? Yes. Hey? The snowy owl's name is Ookpik, which is Inupiaq for snowy owl. Pretty self-descriptive. Snowy owls are the poster birds of the Arctic. Yet despite this, snowy owls are disappearing across their range. Getting this close to a snowy owl is something extremely special. There's only about 30 to 40,000 left of these animals in the world. Snowy owls are listed as vulnerable, and every year, their populations decrease. Being taken care of this well in captivity, they can live up to 35 years, which is a long time for a bird. Out in the wild, they can live maybe 10 years at best. In the warm months, snowy owls return to their preferred breeding grounds north of the tree line. In winter, they travel great distances in search of food, preferring flat areas like prairies, fields, marshes, dunes, beaches, and even airport tarmacs. Snowy owls on runways are dangerous for everyone involved because sometimes they will collide with aircrafts. Their attraction to airport tarmacs has led conservationists to trapping and releasing snowy owls far away from the dangers of plane engines. Project SOAR, the Snowy Owl Airport Rescue, is a volunteer organization that does this important work along with rescuing and relocating other species of owls and raptors. 
Hopefully, as more projects like these take off, we'll see a return of the Arctic's best bird. Awesome. Did you get that? <laughs> Just ruffling your feathers. I'm sorry, did I offend you? Millions of red crabs begin their march for multiplication. When the first droplets of rain fall on Christmas Island, they swarm out of their forest homes and into the ocean to breed. But their migration needs to be perfectly timed. In the last quarter of the moon, as the tide wanes, they spawn before dawn. <laughs> nope, this isn't a Wiccan chant. It's the only time a Christmas Island red crab will reproduce. Depending on when the first rain falls, the crabs either hurry up or take it slow to make this very important date with destiny. Goose is an umbrella term for birds from three separate genera from the same family as swans and ducks. And there's at least 16 different species. The smallest genus consists of the white geese. There are only three species, all North American, and they include the beautiful swan goose. These cranky buttes spend their summers in the Arctic and migrate south during the winter. They travel in huge gaggles of up to a million birds, traversing up to 4,000 kilometers, making them one of the most amazing migration events on Earth. Then there are the gray geese, which are mostly found in Northern Europe and in Asia. They're so similar to white geese that some scientists argue that white geese should be part of this genus. They all have orange legs and beaks and grayish brown feathers. The goose you're more likely to have eaten is the gray leg goose. They were one of the first animals to be domesticated and are considered a Christmas delicacy in Northern Europe. Finally, we have the black geese, a genus which includes the infamously aggressive Canada goose. Black geese are generally brown or black and have black legs and beaks. They're mostly found in North America with two exceptions, the Hawaiian nene and the Siberian red-breasted goose. If you've ever been attacked by a goose in North America, it was probably a Canada goose. For Canada geese, peace was never an option. Their beaks and tongues are serrated with papillae that help them cut plant matter and filter mud when they drink from puddles. The result is one of the most terrifying beaks of all birds. They might not be able to do much damage to a grown person, but you don't want to put your fingers on the business end of that mouth. Canada geese are extremely protective animals that have adapted very well to urban habitats. Cities provide lots of food and protection from predators. They have no fear of people and are comfortable raising their goslings in our parks. They were once protected along with other migratory species, but over the past 50 years, their numbers have exploded and there are now over 7 million Canada geese in North America. The main issue is that human activity has changed their migration patterns. Up until the urbanization of North America, Canada geese would breed in the Arctic in the summer and travel south for the winter. As humans built better parks and offered protection from foxes, wolves, and other predators, they started to stay put year-round. And being here year-round means that they litter our parks with poo. Lots and lots of poo. Every goose and gander produces up to a kilogram of feces every day. All this poo contaminates waterways and has also caused an increase of pathogens in parks and lakes. So if you go to the beach, just make sure that there aren't a lot of droppings around. One of the reasons they poo so much is because they eat our leftovers. They have been observed breaking into dumpsters and trash cans, but some people feed them to get on their good side. In the short term, this is great for geese because they get a lot of yummy food. But in the long term, they end up eating too many carbs and proteins, which can make them sick and cause deformities. The most common of these ailments is angel wing, in which some of the wing bones don't form properly. This causes their primary feathers to point outwards and limits their ability to fly. 
In severe cases, it causes death as geese get rejected by their family or become easy prey for predators. Being part of a family and being so protective of it are some of the reasons that geese are so successful. Some species like the gray lag goose mate for life, while others like the Canada goose stay together for a whole breeding cycle. Having a long-term partner increases the chances of their gosling's survival. It has also been noted that the single geese get more stressed out than the paired birds, particularly during confrontations. But it's not all a romantic fairy tale. Paired geese are known to occasionally mate with other geese if the opportunity presents itself. Hey, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. A relatively high number of goose pairs involve two members of the same sex. In gray leg geese, up to 20% of couples are two ganders. They also reportedly have stronger connections than the other pairs as they perform more displays for each other. And they don't have to worry about taking care of goslings. When it's time to migrate, they most commonly fly in V formations. The formation saves them energy by reducing wind resistance. The goose in the front leads the skine, but also gets a lot more tired. When its shift is over, it falls back and another goose takes over the lead spot. Great teamwork, you lovable jerks. Today, we're having a frosty time in Jasper looking for elk. The Canadian Rockies. A vast mountain range surrounded by thick forests, glaciers, and great plains. This challenging ecosystem is home to the most iconic Canadian mammals. Moose, beaver, and grizzly bears can be found here, just a stone's throw away from each other. But the real king of these mountains actually wears the crown. Today we're in Jasper National Park, and right behind me is an entire herd of one of the largest species of the deer family, the elk. Cervus canadensis are commonly known as elk, but in Europe, moose are also called elk. To avoid confusion, we can call them Wapiti, which is the Shawnee and Cree word for them. Regardless of what you call them, they're second in size only to the massive moose. Those palmate antler giants can be up to 800 kilograms, but the Wapiti is not far behind, tipping the scale at about 600 kilograms. The bulls can be about 30% larger than the females, with massive lads. They're so big and grow so fast that a six-month-old baby wapiti is larger than an adult white-tailed deer. That size means that only the most powerful predators can take them down. Wolves, bears, cougars, and even tigers are their main predators. Yep, they go against Siberian tigers. Unfortunately, they have been overhunted by humans, and their current range is mostly limited to Siberia, the Rockies, and some isolated pockets of North America and Asia. Luckily, around these lands, they're still abundant, and when we were there, it was the best time to see them. Late fall is the breeding season for these elk, so it's very important to keep our distance. Their pheromones are gonna be driving them wild. The males are blocking antlers and the females, well, they're interested in what they've got to show. During this period, the bulls follow females and can establish harems of over 20 cows. But heavy is the head that wears the crown. In order to keep charge of his harem, bulls need to fight off challenging males. To 
Did you hear that? One of the males just bugled. What an amazing sound. It's so haunting. This male thinks he has what it takes to topple the king. Oh my god, he's coming this way. He lowers his head and he's squaring off with the larger bull. Oh wow, he was looking for better footing, but then he decided to just charge in. They crash into one another, locking antlers. Oh no! Come on, little guy! They are locked in battle, pushing each other back and forth, trying to knock the other over. That's amazing! But the challenger didn't stand a chance. This dominant bull is just too massive. The young buck will live to munch another day. The dominant male remains the head of the harem, but he still needs to put the work in for the ladies. To woo them, he uses a bit of an unusual strategy. Urine. The male's urethra points up towards its belly, and when it pees, it soaks its underbelly. Over time, it starts to reek of pee and pheromones, which cows find irresistible. Their pee stain is their chick magnet, but just because cows are attracted to them doesn't mean they'll mate with the dominant bull. He'll try his luck by seductively licking the air. If she picks up what he's putting down, she'll let him mount her. But in this case, it seems she'd rather do anything else. The male leaves her to join another bull for a meal. Bros before does, I guess. For these wapiti, it's the middle of the rutting season, so the male's antlers are as big as they will be before they fall off. You should never approach an elk, but you should especially never approach a male elk during rutting season. <sighs> it's definitely an advantage for elk to lose their antlers for the winter because they're heavy, they radiate a lot of heat, and when there's no reason to fight, why do you need antlers anyway? An elk's antlers will grow back every single spring like clockwork. It's one of the fastest growing tissues on the planet, at two and a half centimeters every single day. The antlers can grow to about 1.8 meters in length and weigh up to eight kilograms. Absolutely massive. They don't only need those antlers for fighting with other male wapiti, but also for warding off attackers. As a blizzard started to move in, we thought our day was over. But then, in the distance, we spotted something. We weren't the only ones following this bull. Across the field and through the trees, a pack of wolves. Oh my god, there they are. A pack of gray wolves has been tracking this bull. Down across the field, there's a whole pack of wolves trying to take down a bull elk. <sighs> this isn't gonna go well. They start their attack. I'm gonna try and get down and get a better vantage point. But this won't be an easy kill. Bull elk are massive, and the wolves will need to coordinate if they're to be successful. The packs surround the elk. Oh my god, this is insane. The pack moves in, snapping at the elk, going for the neck. But this elk isn't going down without a fight. Guys, I can't believe what I'm seeing right now. But in the end, the pack was too much for one elk to hold off alone. Today, we're talking about a cute ball of feathers that has taken over some of the coldest ecosystems in the Northern Hemisphere, the ptarmigan. Ptarmigans belong to the same family as chickens, though they're more closely related to grouse. There are only three types of ptarmigans, the white-tailed ptarmigan, found only in the western part of North America, and the widespread willow and rock ptarmigan, which live in the northern parts of Eurasia and North America. 
But we're in the home of the transformers of the bird world, the willow and rock ptarmigans. This area, with freezing cold temperatures that reach minus 40 degrees Celsius, snow that can be several feet deep, enough to cover them several times over, and thriving with arctic foxes, is a dangerous place to live. Ptarmigans have to adapt to give themselves a chance at survival. Below their cuddly, snowball-like appearance hides a crafty animal with a ferocious roar. Yeah, maybe it's not as ferocious as we thought. <laughs> oh, these ptarmigans are making all kinds of noises. <laughs> oh, there's one that sounds like Wario. Hilarious calls aside, these little guys prepare for winter in truly dramatic ways. The most obvious is their change of coloration. These ptarmigans behind me are just about done transitioning from their summer plumage, which is a rusty brown, to their stark white beautiful feathers. And you can see some of them are still a little bit spotty. Their feather coloration, like the arctic fox's fur, is an adaptation for camouflage. In the summer, their color helps them blend in with the dirt and the vegetation of their northern habitat, while in the winter they turn the color of snow to hide from predators. Sometimes, temperatures drop enough to trigger their transformation before the snow falls. This makes them dangerously conspicuous, but it also makes it easier for us to see their most amazing biological feature, the mammalification of their feet. And yes, I just made that word up, but you'll see what I mean. In the winter, their feet grow a thick layer of feathers that act as a fur coat. Their claws grow to increase the surface area of their feet and give them essentially furry winter boots. Their claws will also be essential for digging burrows to shelter during the harshest months of the year. The willow ptarmigan's scientific name is Lagopus lagopus, which means hare-footed, twice. This is an apt comparison, as many of their body parts have adapted to look the same. Because this is a hare's foot, and this is a willow ptarmigan foot. Looks very similar. It's almost like everything out here is trying to be a hair, or at least a white fuzzy orb. Now, they might be the hare footed bird, but they also kind of look like hares. From a distance, they share a very similar silhouette. And they're not alone. Animals across Arctic climates tend to have a very similar winter body. A lot of the animals out here have evolved along Allen's Law, which is the idea that you reduce your surface area to volume ratio in order to retain more heat. These ptarmigan are no exception. They've got a shorter beak, shorter legs, and even a shorter tail to get closer to that perfect orb form. This adaptation is seen mostly in the willow ptarmigan's northernmost populations. In more temperate places, like the British Isles, they keep their summer outfits throughout the year. Arctic and subarctic populations are the buxom beauties of the family. Of course, keeping warm is just a part of surviving in the Arctic. Finding food is another major problem. Luckily for these snowbirds, they have adapted to survive on extremely calorie-deficient food. Twigs make up the majority of their diet until the thaw. This is also when chicks are born. Ptarmigan chicks will eat insects and young greens, but as they grow up, they become completely herbivorous. Only the best for baby. A steady source of protein keeps chicks happy and gives them a fighting chance in a ruthless environment. By the following winter, they will come back here and congregate in groups of up to 2,000 birds. This protects from predators such as foxes and birds of prey. 
Here, safety is in numbers. Wow! This whole flock of ptarmigans just took off, and there's about 70 of them. These flocks are formed by several families. Oftentimes, the families will just stick to themselves, but every now and then, they'll gather into a flock like this. Except this guy. This guy's like, nah, I'm too good for them. It's always one time again. Too cool for school. So catch up, buddy. It's dangerous to go alone. Today, we're in Churchill, Manitoba, home of the polar bear, looking for its unlikely occasional companion, the Arctic fox. This frigid landscape on the west side of Canada's Hudson Bay has an average winter temperature of minus 25 degrees Celsius, with some days getting as cold as minus 45 degrees. It is no home for the weak. Without proper gear, a person could develop hypothermia in as little as five minutes. Welcome to the set of Animal Logic. Today, we are blessed by the presence of this beautiful arctic fox. These canids are relatively small, at about 60 centimeters in length and weighing just over 3 kilograms. They're just slightly larger than a chihuahua. And yet, they can survive in the expanse of the arctic. In the past, we've talked about how animals in colder climates tend to be larger than in the tropics. Having more fat and a smaller surface area relative to volume helps them keep warm. But Arctic foxes buck that trend. So how do they survive in one of the coldest and most unforgiving climates on Earth? Well, through a multi-pronged survival strategy. The first and most crucial part is being really, really, really good at withstanding the cold. Even at extreme temperatures, Arctic foxes can keep warm due to their multi-layered pelage. About 70% of it is a fine underfur that acts similar to down on birds. Even the pads on their toes are covered in fur, a feature that gives them a rabbit-like appearance. Their scientific name, Vulpes lagopus, means hair-footed fox, as this furry pad adaptation is unique among canids. Fur alone doesn't keep you warm, and usually, heat gets lost through the skinniest parts of your body. To avoid this, arctic foxes have short snouts, ears, legs, and tails. You can see that her ears are actually very short and round, and that's one of the key adaptations that helps her hold on to her heat. Long ears are a little too good at radiating heat outwards, so if they're shorter and rounder, they help her hold on to that heat closer to her body. Her legs are also a lot shorter than other species of foxes, which again helps retain the heat close to her body. During cold snaps, they basically roll themselves into a ball to minimize heat loss. But the Arctic fox's coolest cold fighting adaptation is something called countercurrent blood circulation. This is basically a mechanism that keeps the fox's paws at a lower temperature than its core. Blood entering the paws is used to heat up the blood that's leaving, which prevents the fox's core from being cooled down by losing heat out of its extremities. But just like Thanos, extreme cold in the Arctic is inevitable. But Arctic foxes can withstand it like nobody else. Their metabolic rate doesn't go up until it's minus 50. And they don't even start shivering until it's minus 70 degrees Celsius, which is as cold as it gets in the Arctic. Only the barren plateaus of Antarctica get colder than this. By slowing down their metabolic rate in the cold, their food will digest slower and their bodies will store sugars and fats longer. But it's no guarantee they won't starve. Food is scarce in a harsh arctic winter. All of this sounds like problems that other animals would solve by being bigger. But being large is energetically expensive. And for most of the year, there isn't much to eat around here. 
During the summer, when their fur turns brown to help them blend in with their environment, the pressure is on to eat as much as possible. On an average day, an Arctic fox will patrol the beach during low tide to hunt for fish and invertebrates caught in tide pools. Waterfowl provide ample feeding opportunities. Nesting birds and their eggs are taken with such gusto that a single Arctic fox can consume over a thousand eggs in a single season. Voles and lemmings are also heavily consumed when available, but these species go through boom and bust periods and are usually only readily available every three to four years. But when they're abundant, they make up to 70% of the fox's diet. Arctic fox's ears are adapted to hear the frequency of their prey's chirps and steps under the snow. And then they strike, diving headfirst into the snow to ambush their prey. Foxes are universally known as being smart and resourceful. Arctic foxes are no exception. They figured out that by living in the subarctic, they can refrigerate their food by simply burying it in the snow. Saving food for the lean months can be a literal lifesaver. Some of the caches are huge, and in some cases, they can hold over a hundred birds, most commonly petrels and auklets. By the end of fall, they will have increased their weight by up to 50%. But that doesn't mean they can just wait it out until spring. Even when they have food stashes, finding food is a year-round challenge. But everything is much harder in the winter. In the northern part of their range, the sun sets in late November and doesn't rise again until January. During those long, dark days, temperatures dip into the minus 40s. If they can't find anything to eat, they won't see the sun rise again, and they will die in the dark. One of their survival strategies is to follow this ecosystem's apex predator and hope to eat its leftovers. Polar bears are seal specialists, and once they catch one, they make sure to eat all the fat, which is premium bear fuel. Muscles and other soft tissues are sometimes left behind, and that's when Arctic foxes come in. It's sort of a free meal, but it means traveling vast distances. They've been seen as far as 800 kilometers away from the nearest landmass, and about 150 kilometers from the North Pole. And beyond that, it means being exposed to lots of predators, such as wolves, wolverines, eagles, owls, and even domestic dogs. Unfortunately, three out of four Arctic foxes don't make it past their first winter. And in adults, the mortality rate is still very high at about 33%. Those who do survive the winter go back to their home ranges for the most beautiful time of the year. Mating season! Foxes are monogamous and live in labyrinthine dens and tunnels, which can be up to a thousand square meters. Dens are reused every year, and some have been reported to be over a hundred years old. The largest ones have dozens of chambers and close to a hundred entrances. These furry real estate moguls are usually monogamous, but sometimes live with extended family groups. This is most common in the southern part of their range, where food is more abundant. Because of their high mortality rate, these cuties produce a fox ton of babies. The record for biggest litter is 22, which is one of the largest of all mammals. Parents feed them until summer, but after that, they're forced to go out and become independent. Females sometimes stay nearby, but males have to go far away, sometimes up to 200 kilometers away from their native range. Males defend their territory aggressively and mark it with bodily fluids on conspicuous places, such as mounds of polar bear poo, an unorthodox but effective pedestal. Another of their unique features is their color-changing fur, which is chocolate in the summer and vanilla in the late fall. The color changes help them camouflage better, be it on the brown tundra or on the white ice. But unfortunately, all of these adaptations made their fur too desirable. 
as recently as the late 70s, over 40,000 Arctic foxes were being taken every year. This, combined with climate change and diseases such as rabies, have led to dwindling numbers. As the permafrost melts, red foxes, which are twice as big as their northern cousins, are also moving northward and taking over the Arctic foxes' domain. But thankfully, their range is enormous, and because they reproduce so quickly, there are still enough foxes to consider them a species of least concern. The Canada lynx is the most northern dwelling wildcat in the world. Found mostly in Canada and Alaska, its range is massive and more northerly than any other feline, with its cousin, the Eurasian lynx, being a very close second. The Canada lynx's range is limited by the tree line, relying on the cover of foliage to hide their approach from their prey. As climate change is warming the globe, the northern edge of their range will expand as it becomes warm enough for trees to grow, making the Canada lynx one of the few species that benefits from climate change, at least in this one very specific instance. To get a closer look at them, we traveled to the boreal forests of the Yukon during an early winter cold snap. Temperatures were balmy, peaking at about minus 45 degrees Celsius, but the frozen noses and toes were worth it to see one of the most iconic yet elusive cats in the world. Ah, we finally made it all the way to the Yukon. This is the furthest north I have ever been. We're here to look for some of North America's most incredible cold climate creatures. The Canada lynx's range overlaps with the cougar around the slopes of the mountains of the Pacific Northwest. But luckily, they avoid conflict by going after different prey. Usually. Cougars can weigh up to 100 kilograms and routinely hunt for sheep, goats, and deer, which can be even larger than they are. Canada lynx are much smaller, about the size of an English Cocker Spaniel with a maximum weight of 15 kilograms. The Canada lynx is the second largest member of their genus, after the Eurasian lynx, but they're much larger than their other two cousins, the endangered Iberian lynx and the bobcat, which is technically a lynx. Oh, look at those fluffy tails. This might seem surprising, because at first sight, they look like large house cats. But they're basically just a thick coat of fur wrapped around four stilts. Their fur is about 10 centimeters long in the winter. So if you were to poke one, your finger would disappear in their fur. And then you'd lose it. You shouldn't poke a lynx. Hashtag science. These frosty felines have extra long hind limbs, but they're not designed for a long distance chase. What they are good for is bounding out of the snow and pouncing on their prey. Living in environments full of ice and snow for most of the year makes chasing impractical. So Canada lynx, much like foxes, polar bears, and other northern carnivores, are ambush predators. But before going out on the hunt, you need a big stretch to limber out. Stretch. Oh, that's good. They use their amazing sense of smell and hearing to find their prey's dens. They wait patiently for them to come out, and then they strike. This lynx is on the prowl. Just beyond the tree line, it spotted its next meal. A mallard. It waits patiently for the mallard to get within striking distance. Its gray coat camouflages the lynx perfectly against a tree. And then it pounces. It quickly snaps the mallard's neck, 
punctures its throat, and carries it off into the woods to devour. The lynx calls the boreal forest its home and never really travels beyond the tree line into the tundra because it is so closely reliant on its food sources in the forest. Canada lynx are one of the most specialized predators on Earth. One single prey species can make up to 97% of their diet in parts of their range. For Canada lynx living in those areas, their lives depend on the deaths of snowshoe hares. This reliance on snowshoe hares is particularly important in the northern part of their range, where there isn't much else to eat. An average lynx catches three hares a week, and when there are too many lynx, this causes a hare population collapse. Every 8 to 11 years, snowshoe hare populations dip below a critical point, and the local lynx are unable to get enough food to survive. Snowshoe hare density can fall from over 2,300 hares per square kilometer to about 12 hares per square kilometer in under two years. That's a 99.99% decline in the span it took to reboot Spider-Man. The lynx are then forced to leave the area, sometimes traveling up to a thousand kilometers in search of food. They will have no babies for up to two years. Many lynx starve during this period. Some die of natural causes, exacerbated by the lack of food, and others are forced to go for more dangerous prey and end up dying. This causes a collapse in lynx populations, which eventually leads to a recovery of the snowshoe hares. Then the lynx return, they start having babies, and the cycle starts anew. All of this has happened before. All of this will happen again. These cats only live where snowshoe hares are abundant, and because they face the same environmental challenges, they have convergently evolved to be very similar. The old saying, you are what you eat, does seem to apply to the Canada lynx, because it shares a few adaptations with its main prey, the snowshoe hare. One of the biggest issues for small animals in these regions is how to get around when there are several feet of snow on the ground for over half of the year. Getting stuck in a snowbank can easily be fatal. The lynx's paws are truly massive. This helps them distribute their weight across the snow and acts very much like a snowshoe. Yet another thing it has in common with a snowshoe hare. They're up to 10 centimeters across, which is cartoonishly huge for an animal their size. It would be like a beagle having paws the size of paperbacks. They have short tails and ears to reduce heat loss and they have two layers of densely packed fur to keep them warm at temperatures as cold as minus 60 degrees Celsius. Here in the Yukon, we were lucky to see a brand new mom. It is extremely beautiful here, but it's just as cold as it is pretty. Everything is just frosted and dusted with snow. <sighs> Apparently there's giant mountains here. I just can't see them yet through all the snow. We arrived here in the Yukon pretty late last night, just past midnight. There's only about four hours of sunlight per day here. So we need to work fast, try and find some animals, get some good footage. We're about to go see some Canada lynx and I am so beyond excited. These animals are one of my favorites on the planet. Oh my God, here they come. There's Mama and her kitten. Go! Oh. Yeah. The mating season is spring, and babies are born in early summer. So this kitten is about five months old. She'll stay with her mom until next spring, but won't become sexually mature until the following year. At this age, she can go out with mom on her hunts. Oh, that's a feisty little kitten. She's trying to snag the meat away from her own mom. 
Snowshoe hares are still the main priority, but they won't reject carrion or other easy to catch prey like grouse. Canada lynx are more active at night, but their great senses of smell and hearing can alert them to roadkill or other available prey. In this case, it's the remains of a bird. At night, when they're out on the hunt, they're more likely to run into other lynxes in their range who are doing the same thing. These conflicts can get... awkward. We get it. You don't like each other. The Canada lynx has disappeared from the most southerly limits of its range, but is still relatively abundant in most of Canada and Alaska. It's considered a threatened species in the contiguous 48 states, but it has been successfully reintroduced to Rocky Mountains in Colorado, and there, their populations are growing. If you live somewhere near snowshoe hares, keep an eye out for one of the world's most unique, beautiful, and mysterious cats. You could be in the presence of a Canada lynx. Being this close to a mama lynx and her cub was incredibly heartwarming, and we couldn't get enough. So we left the Yukon and drove 400 kilometers to Alaska to meet up with Steve Kroschel, who happens to be friends with a big male lynx. So, for the second time this week, I am hanging out with a Canada lynx. Our first stop here at the Kroschel Nature Center is to see a lynx. They've got a male one here, and his name is Lennox. This is the land of misfit animals. Walk with me, Danielle. Oh my goodness. I am going to enter the lynx enclosure. Keep walking, Danielle. Come right with me now. We are friends, after all. Wish me luck. I will protect you. Now, I've never let anybody come in here before. Oh, really? No, no, okay. no, this is a first. And you just surprised well, thank me. So you. Gonna, thank I'm you for the honor. close the door. Now, it's a wild and dangerous animal. It's in a territory. You see? So go ahead and shoot. Shoot. You should be oh, safe. Oh, I am. You should be safe. And uh, This is such an honor to be sharing space with the lynx. Well, this is a dream. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, I worked with lynx my whole life. Yeah. The uh, ethology, you see. Now, what I'm going to do here, because he's curious, okay. walk over here on this right side, yep. so I'll protect you. I'm going to give space. And what we're going to do is just talk to him here. Now, I, I have various calls, and I'd like you to make these calls. Oh, me. I'd love to. Uh, the call is as follows. Yeah, see? Perfect. <laughs> okay, now toss this tidbit. Uh, this part. Okay. Your glove mitten's gonna be dirty, but that's that okay. That's fine. I can wash okay. them. Now, call it. Call it. No. Now toss it there. <laughs> Make that call again, Danielle. No. Okay, here's some more. No. Can I? Now throw it. Throw it. No. No. That's it. I do spend all day talking to my cat in her language, so this isn't so different. Good job, Danielle. Thank you. You're building a relationship. Come on over here. Now just He's uh, really been marking this carcass, now, right? Yeah. Now, now what you want to do yeah. is just purr. Because they do purr, you see. No, like this. Oh, that's a very different purr. Yeah. Well, you're building a relationship with the lynx. It's you like beautiful. that? It's one of my dreams come true, essentially. He did not become aggressive. So kind. See, you give off a frequency that the animal can understand. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Various people give off various frequencies, and animals can read it. They read honesty, sincerity, and all of these good things, all these virtues and the animal can tell that. I believe in that very much. Um, all the animals I've ever had in my life have been great judges of character from the get-go. That's the lie detector of the wild. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the don't pet a lynx rule doesn't apply if you're Steve. Oh, oh, 
Oh, that was so sweet. Thanks for having us. Today, we're in the polar bear capital of the world, Churchill in northern Manitoba. But instead of focusing on the world's most popular bear, we're going to look for something a little smaller and rounder. I just spotted a hair, so we're gonna try and get a little bit closer, get a good view. The Arctic hare is a species of hare in the Lepus genus, which is made up of hares and jackrabbits. Its scientific name is Lepus arcticus. Lepus is the Latin word for hare, and arcticus refers to its natural habitat. You can find Arctic hares in the tundras, plateaus, and coasts of the Canadian Arctic islands, northern Canada, Greenland, and as far south as Newfoundland and Labrador. Brrr. If I lived outside in this kind of cold, I'd very quickly become a large, human-shaped ice block. But the Arctic hare has managed to adapt quite nicely. For one thing, they pay very close attention to their weight. Arctic hares pack on the pounds during the summer and end up composed of about 20% body fat. Those love handles are great energy reserves and also serve as insulation during the winter. On average, these guys tend to weigh between 7 and 11 pounds, but particularly large arctic hares can get up to 17 pounds. If you're thinking, hey, that's really big for a hare, you're right, that's really big for a hare. In fact, the arctic hare is one of the largest lagomorphs in the world. Lagomorphs are the hares, rabbits, and pikas that belong to the order Lagomorpha. This hair is easily the size of a small dog. It's definitely bigger than my cat. And to be honest, it's bigger than both of my dogs too. <laughs> Fat isn't the only thing that helps them survive the cold. Their compact bodies have a low surface area to volume ratio that conserves heat. A healthy hair is shaped like an orb. You may not like it, but this is what peak hair performance looks like. It's why their adorable black-tipped ears are so short. Less skin to get cold. They have natural sunglasses in the shape of thick, luscious black lashes that help reduce the glare from sunlight bouncing off the snow. And check out their thick fur. So warm. The color of their fur depends on the weather. In the summer months, hairs can be grayish brown. This helps them blend in with rocks and earth. But when cold, snowy weather arrives, the hairs turn white to match. It's expert levels of camouflage. Arctic hares that live very, very north may stay white all year long. Wait, where's the hair? Oh, I didn't see you there. If I had a hard time spotting them, it's got to be a challenge for the hare's many predators. The foxes, wolves, big cats, and raptors. The Arctic hare, as well as its fellow cold weather lepuses, the mountain and snowshoe hares, provide much needed protein for the ravenous predators of the north. Hey, let go of that mountain hare. Oh no, oh no. Okay, never mind. It's dead. Definitely dead. That was the scariest tug of war I've seen since Squid Game. <laughs> With so many predators on their tails, the arctic hare is super shy. I'd tell them to get out more, but in this case, being an introvert is a necessary survival technique. These hares have incredible vision. With eyes set on the side of their head, they're on constant lookout for threats from all 360 degrees. But hiding isn't their only means of survival. They also have speed on their side. Go, go, go! That was a close one. Arctic hares are total speed demons. They can bound like a kangaroo at 45 kilometers an hour, but in case of an emergency, they can turn on the nose and go 60 kilometers an hour on all fours. The hare uses its long claws on its hind legs to dig into packed ice and snow and leap forward up to three meters at a time. Their long claws also help them dig holes in the snow to keep warm and sleep. 
Sometimes they'll huddle with other Arctic hares for heat, but usually they're found alone. Sleeping, resting, and hiding is a vital part of the hare's survival in the Arctic. They can't afford to waste any unnecessary energy, especially in the winter when food is hard to come by. Though mainly herbivorous, they won't pass up the opportunity to eat meat if given the chance. They have been found eating fish and even caribou carrion. They mostly forage for yummy treats like twigs, bark, moss, grass, leaves, buds, and berries. They get their water by eating snow and chewing ice. Arctic hares mate in April or May. The males may battle over females, with the male literally placing his paws over the female's back and fighting off other males who want her. Eventually, everybody finds their match, and some males will mate with more than one female. All that worry for nothing. The term breeding like rabbits really doesn't apply to the Arctic hare. The resources out here are too few and too precious, so they only have one litter per year. The female hare will make a little nest using a layer of grass and a layer of her own fur for extra warmth. A single litter of two to eight babies will be born anywhere from May to July. Unlike rabbit babies, Arctic hare babies, called leverets, are born with fur coats and their eyes open. They can hop within a few minutes of being born. The leverets grow fast, and by the first frost, they're already full size. They'll be able to breed and have babies of their own the following summer. I know it sounds fast, but keep in mind that Arctic hares only live about five years in the wild. If you think about it, surviving five years in this kind of cold is nothing short of a miracle. Oh my god, I can't feel my toes. Can we go inside now? Today we're in northern Yukon, meeting the shaggiest hoofed mammal north of the Arctic Circle, the musk ox. This video was made possible thanks to the support of our sponsor, Wondrium. You may have heard us talk about the Great Courses Plus before, and now that team has shifted to a new name, Wondrium. But it's not just a new name. They're creating bigger, better, and more exciting content than ever before. Wondrium offers the same mission as before, educational content that's approachable, entertaining, and illuminating. It's a museum for your mind. We've been big fans of the team over at Wondrium because we use the service. While researching this episode, we watched the amazing doc, Earth's Changing Climate. It gives you an in-depth explanation of the effects of climate change on the wildlife of the Arctic and subarctic. It's a must-see documentary. If you've ever wondered about anything, Wondrium will be your new favorite place. And they're giving viewers of Animalogic a free trial. You can support the show by clicking the link in the description or by going to wondrium.com animalogic. Thanks, Wondrium! While muskox are part of the Bovidae family that includes cattle, bison, and buffalo, they're actually in the Caprinae subfamily, which means they're more closely related to true goats and sheep than oxen. The musk in muskox comes from a strong odor males emit during the mating season to attract a female. This eye-watering scent, however, isn't technically a musk since it doesn't come from a musk gland. So really, they're neither musky nor oxen. Aren't names fun? The smell actually comes from the prepucial gland in the male's genitals and is spread all over his underbelly with urine. It's the ungulate equivalent of Axe body spray. If Axe body spray was made of stinky pee, which, let's be honest, isn't it? Oh, I'm so excited to see these musk oxen. And these are a true relic of the Ice Age. They've been around here in Canada for a long time. And everything currently indicates that they will still be here for much time to come. Standing at only a meter and a half tall at the shoulders, musk oxen are stocky, heavyweight herbivores and can weigh up to 360 kilograms. 
When it comes to colder climates, being bigger isn't necessarily better. I'd say these musk oxen have the right idea, because they've evolved to have a much more compact and low to the ground body, which helps them retain their heat. Both male and female musk oxen have long, sharp horns. The horns grow from an area on the forehead called the boss. In males, the boss is extra thick at about 10 centimeters. From the boss, the horns grow down the sides of the head and hook upwards, giving them their distinct 90s heartthrob look. Their horns are used both to protect the herd from predators and during mating duels. During the mating season, larger herds break into smaller breeding groups with a single dominant male, keeping the other males at bay. This is what you call a Yukon standoff. The stakes are high for this lone male, who will engage in brutal contests to keep his status as top bull of the group. Seeing another male on his turf, this bull charges through the snow. He smacks into his opponent at breakneck speed. <gasps> I just heard them bash their heads together. Uh, they use these big horn bosses on top of their heads. The base of their horns actually curves downwards and then back up, which forms a big protective kind of cask on top of their heads. And that's what they'll use to bash each other with. And these males are challenging each other. Their thick horn bosses ensure they don't just die on the spot from a complex skull fracture. The bull backs off and shakes his head. This is meant to intimidate the other muskox, but it also increases blood flow to their heads. This is thought to give their brains extra padding for when they start ramming each other and is observed in other members of its family. Their clashes are violent affairs. They ram into each other with the equivalent force of a car hitting a concrete wall at 30 kilometers an hour. On a calm day, you can hear the smash of their clashes from over a kilometer away. But these battles are not always just between two musk oxen. Player 3 has entered the game. The males will continue to ram into each other until one bull turns and runs. Luckily, in addition to the 10 centimeter boss of their horns, the male's skulls are also three inches thick to prevent their brains from turning to pudding. If you listen closely, you can hear them screaming battle cries while they run. Oh, look at him go! Look at those muskox run! During the Pleistocene, which lasted from 2.6 million to 12,000 years ago, muskoxen were abundant. Since then, the ranges of these cold-loving behemoths are limited to the sub- and high Arctic. Muskox, along with caribou, are the only Arctic-hooved animals to have survived the Pleistocene. Musk oxen are herd animals and live in groups of two to three dozen during the winter months. To keep predators at bay, they have developed some pretty advanced group defense tactics. When threatened, they run together in a tight circle formation or crescent-shaped line, horns pointed out, with the youngest and most vulnerable in the center. Individual adults will then burst out of this circle, heads lowered to chase down their attackers. King Leonidas would be proud. Musk oxen have evolved to withstand the harshly cold temperatures of the Arctic with several adaptations. In winter, they use their hooves to dig through the snow to reach the lichens, roots, and mosses underneath. They come equipped with vertical eye slits that prevent glare and help them spot any tasty grass hiding in the snow. Their slow metabolisms and ability to digest low quality forage helps them maximize the energy they get from their sparse diets. 
Their lips are very muscular and have lots of veins and arteries. This helps them grab things and keep them warm by providing a steady flow of warm blood. Their most striking winterization adaptation is of course their long and shaggy coats. Muskox coats are made up of two distinct layers. The long guard hairs, which hang down to their hooves, and the downy inner insulating layer called the kivute. They kind of look like gigantic tribbles. Just big, round, fluffy boys running across the tundra. Overhunting for this softer than cashmere fiber resulted in their complete extinction in Alaska by 1920, with only a few remaining individuals in Arctic Canada and Greenland. In 1930, conservationists brought 34 individuals from Greenland to Alaska to help populations rebound. Their efforts were a success, and 40 years later, the population had grown to 750. From there, herds were then moved to other parts of Alaska and even Russia, and by the year 2000, more than 4,000 individuals were thriving in Alaska. Currently, there are about 170,000 muskox in the world in 55 populations. Scientists are now studying the potential effects of climate change and Arctic warming on the future of the muskox. With environmental protection efforts, hopefully the musk oxen will continue to thrive for generations to come. We've just been driving through the amazing mountains in Jasper, and we found a moose on the far side of this field. We're going to try and get a better look. But we don't want to get too close. These are actually one of Canada's most dangerous animals, and you want to give them as much space as possible. And trust me, they are much more massive than you can ever imagine. If you think you know how big a moose is, think again. Oh yeah, that's a moose. Oh wow. Despite not having antlers, we know that this one is a male, because the males do lose their antlers in the winter, making this moose an actual bullwinkle. Have you ever seen a moose squat for a pee? Because I'm seeing that right now. Look at me just dead straight in the eye. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm doing this. All right, boss, it's all you. Oh, it's smelly. You smell that? This, oh. This collection of moose antlers you see here around me are all from the same individual. It's actually the moose that's standing right in front of me. Every single year, moose will grow a new set of antlers. And these antlers, as they're growing, are covered by a really nice soft velvet. All of that is fed by blood vessels that run all the way through and over these antlers. This moose antler is a really good example of the velvet because not all of the velvet has fallen off of these antlers. It's so soft. Oh, it's so soft. Oh my goodness. So this helps insulate them from the cold while they're growing. These antlers grow extremely fast. They only have about six to eight months to reach full size before they end up dropping off of their head. That happens after the rutting season because they need these to be in full form when it comes time to mate in the fall. Antlers might look kind of sterile and lifeless, but when you take a look at a recently dropped set, you can see just how well these are fed by the whole animal's system. The shape and size of a moose buck's antlers is extremely tied to the moose buck's level of testosterone. As the moose buck is growing, it'll start producing more testosterone. And so every single year, the new pair of antlers that it creates are going to be bigger and bigger. That is, until it reaches its prime. After it reaches its prime, those antlers are gonna start getting smaller and smaller because it's producing less and less testosterone. <laughs> We're gonna see if we can get up close to a moose buck. <laughs> see if he plays nice. Now I can tell that this moose is in its prime because it has beautiful big palmate antlers. 
As they grow older and past their prime, they won't be as palmate anymore and they'll be more branching. And this male's got a really big dewlap under its chin, which is also a great sign of sexual virility and a great signal for the ladies. Just joining this moose for his lunch right now, being extremely tolerant. It's December now and just at the end of the rutting season for these moose. I can tell that these antlers on this male are not going to last much longer because they've already lost all of that beautiful fuzzy velvet that helps insulate them. And this means that all the blood vessels that usually feed that velvet have essentially wasted away and it has no more use for that. At this point, they're nothing but dead weight for the winter and it needs those resources to stay warm. In any amount of days or maybe the next week or so, it's probably going to be shedding those antlers. Once the worst of the winter passes, it can start developing new antlers for next year. Grow big, little guy. I mean, not so little guy. He's pretty gigantic. This behemoth behind me isn't even done growing at three years old. He's gonna keep growing taller and bigger and heavier and with a more impressive antler set every year until he's at his prime. His prime is probably around seven years old. Buddy, your antlers are so beautiful and I know that next year they're gonna grow even bigger along with the rest of you. I cannot believe what I'm seeing right now. Today I saw the first moose of my entire life, but it was from pretty far away, across the field. And now, as we're leaving at the end of the day, the sun is setting and we're all pretty tired and done for the day. We got back into our car and these two beauties are right there. Right behind me, we've got two members of the largest species of the deer family. These are moose. We've got a mother cow and her calf. This calf is looking pretty big, so she's probably not gonna stick around with mom for very much longer. What a good mother, she's looking both ways before crossing with her calf. Just so special to get to see not one, but two moose. I've always wanted to see a moose. I feel like the animal logic Cross Canada trip wouldn't be complete without seeing a moose. Instead, we get two. I grew up in, in northern Quebec in an area that was fairly forested and woodsy. It was moose territory for sure, but sadly I just was never lucky enough to find one. Sometimes it's all luck, you know? And this, this beside me is Dylan, the wild Dylan, one of a kind. Every time I think I know how big a moose is, I'm wrong, very wrong. You think that a moose is roughly horse size? Just at least double that, cause it's, it's a lot more. Just outstanding. Look at those little moose butts, so cute. As always, you need to respect an animal's space and give them as much distance as they could possibly want, and then some. I'm so glad we made it out here. This is insane. We just saw a mother and her calf, and now there's a bull and a cow on the road, and they're the biggest things I've ever seen. This is insane, guys. I've never seen a moose in my life, and now I've seen five in one day? Jasper, you are beautiful. Look at these guys, can you see that? Right in the middle of the road and licking the ground. So one thing that draws these giant moose out onto the roads like this is to lick salt. Cause salt is a very important part of any ungulate's diet. Here we go. Oh my God. <gasps> what? How is this possible? This is seven moose. No way. This one's even bigger than the last bull. No more than, what would it be? Like less than a kilometer down. There's another pair, two more. 
It's just unbelievable. Do we have most insurance? Yeah, we have like the full insurance for everything. Oh. This time it's a mother and her calf. So we found two mothers with calves and then a mating couple. Did I say that I saw seven moose? Make that nine. We've got another mother and calf right in front of our vehicle. Licking that salt off the road. This is just ridiculous. It's tough to see them in the dark, so you need to keep those high beams on. Out here, it's all that's gonna save you. Look at her little tongue go. I mean, little. It's actually a freaking massive tongue. Guys, I can't get over it. This is probably the most Canadian day ever. And um, maybe I'll just start celebrating Canada Day on October 15th. Yeah, why not? Thanks, Moose. Today, we were in the Yukon, getting up close and personal with the largest land mammal in North America, the iconic bison. Whew. Try to keep warm in the most northern location that we have ever shot for Animal Logic. We are just outside of Whitehorse at the Yukon Nature Preserve. Right in front of me, there's a bunch of bison. These are wood bison and this species of bison only lives in very northern locales. Bison are part of the Bovinae subfamily. Some of their close relatives include cows, yaks, and water buffalo. Bison are often incorrectly referred to as buffalo. True buffalo, however, consist of many different species native to Africa and Asia. Today, there are two living species of bison. European, bison bonassus, and American, bison bison. The American bison is further divided into two subspecies, the wood bison, bison bison athabasque, and the plains bison, which bears the fun to say scientific moniker, bison bison bison. The subspecies wood bison inhabit a more northerly range across northern Canada and Alaska. They're typically slightly larger than plains bison, but classifying them can sometimes be difficult due to hybridization between the two. American bisons as a whole are the largest land animals in North America, with the males standing at about six feet tall at the shoulders and weighing up to 900 kilos. That's about as big as a compact car. These bison are so well insulated that the snow that's falling and accumulating on their backs doesn't melt. It just sits there. Despite their bulked up appearance, bison are actually extremely quick on their feet, achieving speeds of up to 56 kilometers per hour in just a few strides. They're also super agile. They're able to make quick turns and even leap over high fences. Bison herds tend to be a harem arrangement, meaning that there's one male who is the boss of it all and several females who keep him company. They all know their place though, and the biggest bison is always on top. They put all this power to good use during the rut, when competition is high and bison bulls fight for dominance. These fights involve crashing their skulls together or hooking the opponent's head from side to side with their half a meter long horns and lifting their forelegs off the ground. Luckily for bison, they have big, thick skulls that can withstand this kind of battering. Today we are in the Yukon, looking for one of the world's most elusive and relentless predators, the wolverine. Years ago, in our first season, we talked about wolverines. But since we got the opportunity to see them up close, we had to take another look. Right now, I'm following some footprints, and I can only assume that those belong to a wolverine. The footprints of a wolverine don't look anything like a coyote or a wolf. They look a little bit more like a bear print. Obviously, a little bit smaller. Yeah, you can see how there's two, two trails here. Now, I bet you anything that if this was a coyote and a wolverine, the wolverine was probably the one chasing the coyote. I put my money on that. Wolverines are very elusive creatures, and seeing one in the wild is incredibly difficult. 
So we decided to head down to Alaska to meet the man who's best friends with one. Whew, well, we've made it to the Kroschel Wildlife Center in Alaska. The guy who runs this place, Steve Kroschel, is kind of a local celebrity within the Yukon and Alaska. He's known as the Wolverine Man. I really want to know why that is. And I think we're going to find out. Whoa! Hi! Hi! Don't move! Hi! Oh, that's why. This is Jasper, a wolverine that Steve has raised in captivity since 2008. This is the sixth litter of wolverines that I've had in 40 years. Really? They're very hard to propagate in captivity. You have to go back into bloodlines where rescues from trappers in the Arctic. So how many generations of captive wolverines does he come from? Oh, it would have to be two, two, at least two, yeah. At first glance, you might mistake the wolverine for a small bear. But really, they're more closely related to weasels. They belong to the Mustelidae family, alongside fellow cutthroat cuties like badgers, otters, pine martens, and ermines. Much like everyone's favorite X-Men, wolverines are native to Canada, but they can also be found across boreal forests and tundras of the US and Eurasia, which means they need to survive freezing cold, high latitude temperatures. And after millions of years of evolution, they're not just surviving, they're thriving. Just look at those coats. Their thick, oily fur is hydrophobic, meaning it repels water. That's right, the wolverine is waterproof. Talk about a real superpower. Without this ability, the snow or the blood of their prey would wet their skin and accelerate heat loss. In the Arctic, moisture can be deadly. Their paws are large and furry and act as snowshoes to prevent them from sinking too far into the snow. These murder mittens are equipped with semi-retractable claws that they use for climbing, digging, scaring away predators, and the occasional villain. Their scientific name is Gulo Gulo, which is Latin for glutton, and they live up to that. They'll eat anything that they can get their paws on, from plants and berries, to mice and rabbits, to elk and moose. Even carrion is on the menu. Ah, delicious carrion. All the yummy meat without the pesky time and energy spent hunting. Clever wolverines have been known to drive away much larger animals, such as wolves and cougars, and take over eating the carcass of their prey. Sorry, but the wolverine isn't here to make friends. Wolverines will defend their meals by any means necessary, and whatever they can't finish in one sitting is claimed by spraying it with a strong, stinky musk and burying it for later. Yum! Can you help me build a winter kill moose carcass scenario? Absolutely, where do we start? This is a real move. We're just here, putting it together here. like Mr. Potato. Grab that yeah. antler over there too, Danielle. Yeah. It's heavy. Hind feet, front feet from a single moose. These are hind feet. That is front foot. I don't know what that's supposed to be. Like middle of the body. This is just a dislocated leg. I'm burying parts of a moose carcass, trying to make it look like a moose that died by avalanche. Because that's exactly what wolverines are looking for. Carcasses that have been dead and frozen in the ground for some time. For the record, I didn't kill the moose, okay? It was hit by a car, and now it gets to be a part of the food chain. This is literally the opposite of what I do with the ROM. Over there, I take the bones out of the ground. Right now, I'm putting them in the ground. Does that look good? Does this look like a moose that died by avalanche? We got Steve here putting the icing on the moose as a final touch. Oh yeah, I'm really starting to believe this. Just start pounding away on that moose carcass. <laughs> That's it. Summon my inner wolverine. Yes. That's the body of the moose right there. Pack away. Pack, pack, pack. Pound it down. Oh, I can smell it. Yep. 
You're going to be a new woman by the time you're done here, Danielle. So what are we doing right here with these buckets of water? What I'm doing is I'm trying to get this solid because a Wolverine is smart. They all know this is a fake movie set. <laughs> so we want it to last more than a few seconds. It'll freeze shortly and then we'll bring the Wolverine in here and all hell's going to break loose. Great. What do you think of this, this Wolverine meal? I think it's perfect. Yeah? It looks like Thanksgiving. Come and get it. While you and I see the world through our eyes, Wolverines see the world through their nose. The Wolverine sense of smell is outstanding. They can smell one molecule out of five million in the air. Whereas me, I can just smell one in 250,000. That's leagues better than me. They find food using their incredible sense of smell. Wolverines have the ability to sniff out carcasses buried under 20 feet of snow. With so much of their prey being killed in avalanches every year, the Wolverines' heightened sense of smell is key to their survival. Are you ready to take a risk? And I will protect you if things go south, because it is a wild and dangerous animal after all. So are we going to let it explore this while we're in its enclosure? We're going to try. And okay. I've never ever done this where there's a free roaming wolverine mm -hmm. with anyone other than me. I, I take that back. There was a one person. I won't tell you his name. He tried That's it, okay. but it only lasted for like 30 seconds. It and got then... bad. It got dangerous. Literally, I had a dive between him and the animal. Now, the wolverine was just curious, but mm -hmm. we can't be sure. But it's okay for me to be here. Well, you know why? <laughs> you know why I feel that way? Why? Because you give off the right kind of frequency. You have a compassion and an insight that I don't see very often in a human being. All right, well, I'm putting a lot of trust in you and a lot of trust in the wolverine. Did you sign the release? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Were you serious though, or was that like just good acting about about no one else ever doing this? No, I'm serious. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but there's. Some <laughs> I had to ask. Are you all ready? I'm all ready. Just get my my gloves on. I'll be good to go. I've got something I want to give you. Oh, what's this? Oh, that is pungent. That's Wolverine lure. Have you ever smelled that before? No, it doesn't smell like anything I've ever smelled in my life. You just put one little speck of that in the center of that moose carcass, and I think we'll get the Wolverine to claim that carcass. And okay. Stick it in the snow right on the top. Just, just dab in the it snow. in there? All right. This is it. This is the pièce de résistance. Now, this stuff is made with real wolverine musk. This is going to draw the wolverine down to investigate. And what wolverines do when they have carcasses that, that they want to eat or save for later, they mark it for themselves by spraying it with more musk. So it's gonna smell this and say, hey, I'm gonna put my stink on it. We want him to come and claim this for himself and then dig in. Okay, Danielle, I'm going to go out and get Jasper and I'm going to bring him over here like you're carrying a child uh, in a car seat and I'm going to go through there and then I'm going to let him go in there and once he's in there I'm going to summon you to come in with me. Okay, stand right here just in case something goes right there. Stand right there. All right, and I I'm won't gonna... move until you give me the signal. And I will be back. I hope this works. All right, I think we're just about ready to let this guy go. Don't move. Oh! Here we go. I hope Jasper likes dinner. Here we go. I'm going in with a wolverine. Oh, he's going straight for it. Oh, look at that. Jasper's already exploring that, that moose carcass. I am so happy that this wolverine is comfortable with my presence right now. I feel pretty calm about it myself now that I can see how relaxed Jasper is. Guess it goes both ways, you know? I'm elated. My heart is just, oh, it's, it's pounding out of just sheer excitement. What a beautiful animal. Don't worry, I'm not gonna stand on your moose. All yours. Oh my goodness. Oh. 
Let's see, Steve knows how to speak to this wolverine. He just warned the wolverine to step off, because I'm not a meal. <laughs> At least not yet. At over a meter long and about as heavy as a German Shepherd, the females are about 30% smaller than the males, but equally as chaotic. These stocky mustelids weigh between 11 and 18 kilograms. Their fur is brown or black, with a yellow or gold stripe from their head to their tail. The markings on their faces, necks, and chests are unique to each wolverine. Kind of like hyper-aggressive snowflakes. And they are aggressive. Like, really, really, capital A, aggressive. Wolverines are always on the prowl, only taking breaks for naps and mating. The only thing these demon ferrets like more than eating its prey is killing it. The wolverine's ferocity is so legendary that people living out on the land told me that they'd rather run into a polar bear than a wolverine. Crikey! Wolverines can hit speeds of almost 50 kilometers per hour running across the snow. If they ran that fast on a city road, they'd likely get a ticket. They're also great climbers and super strong for their size. Can he dig out the foot? He's got the oh, foot! Oh no! He's got the foot! Having raised several litters of wolverines from birth, Steve has become somewhat of a wolverine whisperer. And in order to be as safe as possible in the enclosure, he taught me to speak wolverine. All right. I hear, I hear him talking now. Okay, so. Oh, that's him? Yeah. <sighs> I can hear him. Yeah. He's excited. Yeah. Do you think yeah. he can smell the moose? Oh yeah, they can smell frying bacon from 25 miles away in the Arctic if the wind's blowing right. There are certain voices now that I make <laughs> and, and, and vocalizations to, to communicate with the wolverine. And one of them is this. Dow! Go ahead, do it. Dow! And then, hi! Hi! Louder. Hi! Dow! And then, hi! Hi! Louder. Hi! I'm over here on this side, and out on this side. Hi! That's it. And then, ha, 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 ha. That's it. That's it. Ha, 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 ha. Yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Ha, ha, ha. That's it. Ha, ha, ha. That's it. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Hi. Just, you got it. Ha. Yeah, here's, see? See? Hi. See? Oh, 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 he just did a, he did a front flip. Hi. Hi! <laughs> I love Wolverine noises. You hear that? That's moose bone breaking in his teeth. All of their front teeth are extremely sharp and long. All the better for crunching into that frozen flesh. But the teeth at the back of their mouths their molars, those are built for crunching through bone. A wolverine's third upper molar is actually turned inwards like other mustelids, except theirs is way bigger. And this is designed to help them hold onto and crunch bones much more effectively, especially because most of their meals, like this one, are frozen. So he's grabbing onto that meat and twisting and turning to pull off pieces of frozen flesh. Wolverines don't mind at all if their meal is frozen. Frozen meat is what they're built for. In the wild, if you got this close to a wolverine on a carcass, that would be a true miracle. Oh, I bet. You'd have to be, and it might only happen once in a lifetime. Well, he's extremely patient and I'm grateful for that. Oh, well, that looks like fun. I want to join him with that. I want to roll around on my back in the snow. Wolverines, everything they do, even if they're starving to death in the wild, is about having fun while you're trying to survive. They're comical. They're not a ferocious, nasty animal. Mm -mm. An animal that does have interest in having fun is a sheer sign of intelligence. And it just goes to show just how smart these animals are. While many species in their range get through the winter by hibernating, wolverines just don't care about the cold. While everyone else is sleeping, the wolverine gets to hunting. This is the other benefit of being able to smell through the snow. They can easily find animals hibernating under the snow and make sure they never wake up again. Don't work hard, work smart. 
It really doesn't matter if you're dead or alive. Everything looks like a gourmet meal to a wolverine. When they find a moose carcass, they'll often take up residence inside its body, like Han freaking Solo in a tauntaun. Many of my bush pilot friends in the Arctic, they're flying over, they see where one is in a, a caribou. That's amazing. Or a moose. Yeah, yeah. They get very possessive too. Combine the wolverine's bite, thick hide, and sharp claws with a large dash of brazen confidence, and you've got one deadly predator. The wolverine is so tenacious that it can take down animals up to five times their own size. The wolverine kills its prey with a bite to the neck, which severs its tendons and crushes its throat. But even the kings and queens of chaos aren't impervious to predators. They have to watch out for wolves. Wolverines can take on one, two, even three wolves. But if they're ganged up on by a pack, they can get themselves killed. On the plus side, wolves kill other animals, thereby creating yummy carrion for the wolverine. They have a complicated relationship to say the least. Wolverines are super solitary and extremely territorial. They're always on a solo quest for food and only ever stop munching to mate and raise kids. The male's home range is huge and can be up to 620 square kilometers. They mark that territory and communicate with other animals using their anal scent glands. That pungent odor is the reason they've earned nicknames like skunk bear and nasty cat. That's a bit rude. Make fun of their smell all you want, but spreading their stinky musk is how they meet partners. Wolverines are a polygamous species that can mate with any member of the opposite sex living in or overlapping with their territory. Breeding season is between May and August, and the females are the first ones to make a move. After they first meet up, they'll mate for a couple days and then go their separate ways. Females have the ability to delay the implantation of the eggs until as late as the following spring. The actual gestation only lasts 30 to 50 days. Once she's safe and hidden in her den, mom will give birth to three kids. Wolverine dads used to get a bad rap, but recent research suggests that they play a bigger role in raising kids than previously thought. Fathers have been spotted visiting the mom wolverines when they're nursing their young. Some dads even take an interest in their offspring when they're older, teaching them how to survive in the wild and even just playing. But let's be real, mom does most of the work. The kits are weaned off her milk at three months old. They'll be full-sized at a year old and reach sexual maturity at age two or three. True symbol of the Arctic wilderness is the wolverine, more so than the polar bear, the grizzly, I never thought, Danielle, that you'd be this interacting with this wolverine's behavior. This is amazing. Here, touch his, touch his arse. Can I? Go ahead. Oh my God. Oh, it's so soft. All right, there he goes. <laughs> Bye, Jasper. I love you. <laughs> Researchers aren't sure how many wolverines there are in the world. They're so elusive and mysterious. But their numbers took a big hit back when humans used to hunt them for their fur. They're also threatened by global warming. Wolverines need deep mountain snows to den, and scientists believe their habitats will shrink as temperatures rise. So let's fight climate change and protect the wolverines. They'd do the same for us. Actually, on second thought, maybe they wouldn't. They'd probably just let us all die and happily feast on our carcasses. Classic wolverine. Mm -hmm.